Okay, so in this lecture I want to talk a bit of more about symbolizing conditionals. And you know, I've said, you know, conditionals are tricky for a lot of reasons. One which we've talked about a little bit and I'm not going to say much more about or really any more is that there's some really deep philosophical issues, some really tricky ones you get into with conditionals, you know. The stuff about counterfactuals that I talked about in the last lecture. You know, it's important to go over, but if that stuff confuses you, think no more about it. It will not be on a test except for maybe extra credit. So you won't lose any points if you don't know about it, right? But I think this stuff about symbolizing tricky conditionals or seeing conditionals when they might be in a way hidden is very important. And some other stuff I'm going to talk about, you know, in connection with this, necessary and sufficient conditions, those are really important for logic. So let's start with, you know, a phrase that's pretty natural, right? You, you can imagine how you might come across this, right? Imagine you're in a really hard class where nobody makes an A on their own, but pr the professor curves the grade, you know, but only one person gets an A, right? Two people with the highest grades are this guy Peter and this woman Beth, and you know, you say, well, he'll get an A unless she does. Peter will get an A unless Beth does. Now, how would you symbolize that, right? Given the materials we have so far, could you symbolize this sentence? Well, how would you do it, right? Now, look, we don't have any connective for unless nothing works for that. But think about what this sentence means, right? Could we rephrase this to use and or or the arrow symbol, right? You can actually rephrase it to use any of those, but probably the most natural is to rephrase it as an if-then statement that uses the arrow. So let's rephrase what this sentence is saying with an if-then. How would we do that? Peter will get an A unless Beth does. You know, our two, you know, propositions are going to be Peter will get an A, Beth will get an A. What's the relationship this sentence is saying holds between those? Think about it a second. If you were going to plug these in to the if-then statement and maybe add something, what would it look like? Well, seems to me the easiest way to rephrase this would be, if Beth doesn't get an A, Peter will. If she doesn't get an A, he will. So this is saying anytime she doesn't get an A, he gets an A, right? If she doesn't, he does. Seems to me, you know, and I think if you think about it, hopefully you won't disagree, that these two sentences, if she doesn't get an A, he will and he will get an A unless she does mean the same thing, right? So if you encounter this unless, this is the way you deal with it, you know? It's really just without saying not, it's making a not statement with a conditional. Unless Jim Bob studies, he will fail French, right? How would we rephrase this? using a conditional. We would rephrase it, if Jim Bob does not study, he will fail French, right? He needs to study to pass French, which means if he doesn't do it, he will fail, right? Unless he does this, he will fail. So if he doesn't do it, he fails. You know, if I wanted to be really good about this and have proper form, I would write these out, right? S equals Jim Bob studies, F equals he fails French, right? But you, you guys can get, you know, I think the meaning of this without me doing that, right? I'm going to be a little sloppy on these, which, you know, maybe I shouldn't do with logic, but, you know, I don't want to hammer it into the ground and throw a lot of verbiage at you don't need, right? So not going to give you like the little key that says what everything stands for here. I think we're at a point we can just kind of go through these, right? Hopefully.
Well, now, these bring us to another sort of sentence. How would you rephrase this? You must be at least five foot tall to ride Space Mountain. I think it might be four feet tall. I don't know how tall you need to be to ride Space Mountain. It's either five feet or four feet, right? You've got to be a certain height to ride the rides. I remember when I was a kid and I wasn't that height. Drive me crazy, right? Especially we'd go to we'd go to Dollywood in Tennessee a lot when I was a kid and I just remember like being too short. Then, you know, hit your growth spurt and you're the height, and it's like it's the greatest thing ever, right? So, you must be five foot tall to ride Space Mountain. Well, think about what this is saying, right? No, we could rephrase this with our old friend, the, you know, with the unless statement. Unless you are five feet tall, or at least five feet tall, you can't ride Space Mountain, right? What would that look like? Well, we're saying unless. Now we're saying can't. What we're saying and what this sentence says, if you are not at least five foot tall, you can't ride Space Mountain. If you are not at least five foot tall, you cannot ride Space Mountain. Now again, there's some stuff if you want to really be fussy about how to symbolize these, they would use some concepts that we're really not going to cover in this class about quantification that gets really tricky I'd like to do it we just don't have the time right but if you want to do this pretty quickly and get the main idea across you are not five feet tall then if you are not five feet tall you cannot ride Space Mountain so we can rephrase this with an if then if not at least five feet tall can't ride Space Mountain captures the same idea, says I think exactly the same thing as you must be at least five foot tall to ride Space Mountain. What about this? Becoming president requires that one be at least 35 years old. We don't have an if then anywhere here. We don't have an unless. But how could you rewrite the basic thought here using an if then statement. If blank, then blank. Or if not blank, then not blank. Coming president requires that one be at least 35 years old. You must be 35 years old to become president. I guess we should say legally becoming president, but whatever. Well, we could rephrase this. If you are not at least 35, you cannot become president. Not T, then not P. Why do I spend so much time on these? Why am I talking so much about how to symbolize this one sort of statement? Because these statements are a really important kind of statement. These pop up in science and math and, yes, the law. These are, they even pop up in syllabi sometimes, you know, when I'll lay out what you need to do to pass a class, right? These are called necessary conditions. And now necessary conditions is a slightly tricky concept, so I'm going to put this a few different ways and hopefully at least one of them will make sense to you. I'll throw out a lot of examples, I think that will help too. To say something is a necessary condition means it is something that must be the case for something else to be the case. Or if you want to put this another less abstract way but still pretty abstract, X is a necessary condition for Y means you cannot have Y without X. If you don't have X, you don't have Y. Y cannot be true unless X is. So how do we symbolize this? How would you symbolize Y cannot be true unless X is? If we're saying X is a necessary condition for Y, we're saying if X is not true, Y cannot be true, right? Y cannot be true unless X is, so if X is not true, Y is not true. Well, if X is not true, then Y is not true. Once we have it in that form, it shouldn't be too hard you know, if we think about our conditionals, 
not x arrow not y. If x isn't true, then y is also not true. Anytime x is false, if x is really a necessary condition for y, whatever x is, anytime it's false, y will be false as well. So here's some examples of necessary conditions. To win the lottery, you have to buy a ticket, or to win the lottery, you must buy a ticket. To make it to Carnegie Hall, one must practice. Drinking legally, you know, some of these get pretty far from if-thens, right? But if-then is a decent way to th get across what they're saying, to capture it. Drinking legally requires that one be 21. A team can't win a baseball game unless they show up. Mammals are warm-blooded animals. Now, one thing to note, all of these are saying, if you don't buy a ticket, you won't win the lottery, right? It is not saying that anyone who buys a ticket will win, right? It is not saying, if you buy a ticket, you win the lottery. That would be crazy. It's not saying, if you practice, you'll make it to Carnegie Hall. You know, maybe you just don't have talent, right? Or, may, you know, you have to be amazingly talented to be some kind of concert pianist or violinist or whatever you know usually people who are 21 can drink legally but not necessarily right anyone in the US at least who's not 21 can't drink legally but you know if someone's on parole for some kind of alcohol related offense it might be a condition of the parole that they not drink right and you know if a team doesn't show up they can't win but you don't win just by showing up, right? Even if both teams show up, only one can win, right? If something is not a warm-blooded animal, it is not a mammal, but not everything that's warm-blooded is a mammal. Birds are also warm-blooded, right? All we're saying is if X is not true, then Y is not true. We're not saying if X is true, Y is, right? Certainly, you don't become president the second you hit 35, right? You can't be president unless you're 35, but simply being 35 does not mean you get to be president, right? Someone who's well over the age of 35, all I can say is thank goodness, you know, being president seems like an incredibly stressful job to me. Anyway, even if you wanted to be president, it's not enough just to hit 35, right? So let's talk about a closely related but very different idea from necessary conditions, and that is sufficient conditions. I think of the two, sufficient conditions are pretty easy to understand. It's not so hard to define them, but it is very, very important that we distinguish them from necessary conditions, that we not mix the two up. A sufficient condition means if x is a sufficient condition for y, whenever x is true, y is also true. More simply, if x, then y. Well, how are we going to symbolize that? I hope you didn't think that last was some sort of trick or rhetorical question because it's not. It really is as easy as you probably thought it was. If x is a sufficient condition for y, we're saying if x then y. We just symbolize it in this old way we should be familiar with, x arrow y, right? All right. So here's some examples of sufficient conditions. If a team scores the most runs, they win the baseball game. Being caught cheating on a major assignment will result in a student failing the class. You know, imagine you see that as explicit class policy in somebody's syllabus. What they're saying is if a student is caught cheating, they will fail. Being caught cheating is a sufficient condition for failing the class. Any student who does the extra credit assignments will pass, right? You see that in the syllabus. If someone does the extra credit assignments, they will pass. If, then. 
windows hit with large rocks will break. Well, what's that sentence really saying? You can rewrite it as an if then. If a window is hit with a large rock, it will break. You want to say sufficient conditions. Being hit with a large rock is a sufficient condition for a window breaking, right? Now look, one thing to keep in mind, and if you think about the logic of these if-then statements with the arrow, it should be really clear, is that this isn't the only way for any of these to happen, right? A team can win without scoring the most runs, the other team might forfeit, right? If a team just doesn't show up, or the fans riot, they forfeit, even if the team that forfeits is way ahead when their fans riot, the other team still wins, right? You know, student might not cheat on anything, but if they just don't turn anything in, they will still fail, right? You know, might not do a single extra credit assignment, but if you make an A on every single assignment that's not extra credit, you're going to pass, right? If you hit a window with a baseball or, you know, a BB, you know, shot from a BB gun, that will break the window. All this is saying is hitting a window with a large rock is one way to break it. It's not the only way, right? Sufficient conditions are not, I think, that tricky because they are really just if-then statements. If you have the logic of the straight up if-then down already, once you recognize something as a sufficient condition, it's not hard to handle. Just don't mix them up with sufficient conditions. Now one final thing that's a little tricky, and these are kind of rare but they're important to know they exist because they do pop up in science and math and also in the way that some laws are written is when something is a necessary and sufficient condition. You know, you might, I looked this up, Royal Society of Chemistry, how they defined gold, I was looking for a scientific definition and they just said gold is element 79, right? If some scientist tells us gold is element 79, well think about how you would define that. How would you symbolize this with if-then statements? What's this person saying? He's saying, well, if something is element 79, it's gold. And he's also saying, well, if it's gold, it's element 79. So if you do run into something that's a necessary and sufficient con def condition like this, which you might see in a definition, science, math, law, use the biconditional. Gold is element 79. You know, just use S for 79. If something is gold, it's element 79, and if something's element 79, it's gold, we use our little biconditional arrow that points in both directions. Now, I, I don't think I will give you any of these on the test, certainly not unless it's extra credit, but sometimes you will see people, especially in definitions, list out conditions that on their own are necessary, but when put together are sufficient you will see this in definitions, right? Another scientific definition I saw, a mammal is a warm-blooded vertebrate with fur that nurses its young, right? Each of these on its own is a necessary condition. To be a mammal, have to be warm-blooded, have to be a vertebrate, have to have fur or hair. You know, humans have hair, but we'll just say f some kind of hair or fur. Has to nurse its young. Each of these on its own is a necessary condition. Put together, all together, they are sufficient. How would we symbolize it? We'd use this kind of big, you know, really, you know, not very simple and kind of ugly looking statement. Warm-blooded, vertebrate, warm-blooded and vertebrate and fur and nurses its young. If all that, then it's a mammal, and if it's a mammal, then all that, right? You know, I'm not going to put a lot of weight on these. They're a little tricky. Just know they exist, and it's the way, you know, especially 
in science and math, a lot of times when you see something defined, this is the way you would symbolize it. Also in law sometimes. Anyway, I don't think on the actual test I'm really going to ask you guys to do much symbolizing necessary and sufficient conditions. To do these properly, like I said, you need some concepts and tools we're really not going to cover. Um, the way I'm doing this is, you know, it's not quite right, but I hope it gets the basic idea across. Um, I will, I, I will give you statements that are necessary or sufficient conditions or maybe neither and ask you to pick them out so you should be able to do that so just you know just a heads up and hopefully the basic idea of necessary and sufficient conditions makes sense to you because like I said it is important in more than a few areas <laughs>